Okay, chunks of stuff. Deadlines unchanged. So, exam three, covered part three. Exam four, covered part four. This is part four, covered part four. Deadline uh, December 7th, end of day, so at 9 p.m. And uh, the paper, the 50% deadline remains. Uh, December 8th, also at 9 p.m. And the final deadline is the normal, normal time. And again, to see if you need the final or not, because assume no one actually likes taking the finals, the thing to do is once you've done exam three and four, uh, get your paper graded there, and done all the quizzes you wish to do, go to Blackboard, get the grade estimator that's available in Excel, which works with Excel and various other Excel compatible stuff. Also, the Google Sheets things have worked with Google Sheets and other compatible stuff, and just put in your uh, best three exam scores and a hypothetical 100 for the final, and of course your quiz grade, your paper grade, and then compare the overall grade, the results there, with your real overall grade, and if that boosts your real overall, boost your potential grade by at least a you know, letter grade or better, then taking the final would be worth, potentially worth doing. If it can't improve your grade in terms of letter grade, then doing it would do nothing. So suppose you're like an 83.4, overall grade, and 100% of the final will give you an 85.7. That would improve your numerical grade, but it would still be a B. So doing the final would do nothing. You can always take it. The final can't hurt your grade, but again, to see if you actually uh, could benefit from it, that's how to check. Uh, upcoming meetings, not canceling class, but packing in office hours, uh, December 3rd, so next Monday, from 12 to 1-ish. Not sure exactly, we'll end before class, but one issues. Uh, December 5th on the Wednesday, 12 to 2. Okay, before heading on to our new stuff, namely finishing up about ethics and other normative areas, anything about the stuff that's been or stuff to be that needs more stuff. Okay, so last time we we're looking at ethics and how it fits in with other stuff. And we were looking at how, when it comes to each of the areas, there's the positive and negative value, and the terms for that are, are reason, you know, like good and evil, um, righteous, holy versus sinful, with law, legal versus illegal. And then we also looked at the idea that these areas interrelate. So to illustrate, people often want to take what's in their religion and make it into law. Both Isis and Sarah Palin agree on that basic principle. What is the religion should be in the law. But as that example illustrates, people disagree about what is the one true religion. Well, it's always theirs. And people disagree about how much of it should go into the law. Also, maybe you'll take the view that what's in ethics, what is evil should be illegal. What is good should be you know, made into legality. But of course, we know from history there can be very evil laws, and there are many things that are we would think of as being bad that we wouldn't want to have the police and courts involved with. So, for example, someone cheating on their significant other, wrong. But we probably don't want to have like relationship police going around tasering people for cheating, like tasering, you know, like cheating the first degree, double taser. Uh, maybe we do. <laughs> Who knows? It depends how you feel about that bad behavior. Last two areas, uh, etiquette. Now the terms for etiquette are pretty straightforward. You know, positive is being well-mannered, polite. And negative, of course, is being rude, crude, impolite. Basis of etiquette? Well, what makes it right to have certain forks in a certain order besides certain things? Well, we just make that stuff uh, complete fiction. And so the laws of etiquette are completely made up. Uh, rewards and punishments, well, they can vary quite a bit. We often regard whatever is considered polite behavior to be, in whatever context, to be you know, commendable. And sometimes we reward that. And behavior that's considered bad behavior in terms of etiquette, we often look down upon. And of course, there can be unexpected consequences for brutal behavior. Here's one weird example. Uh, years ago, there was a person applying for an academic job, not here at another university, and the person pretty much had it locked in. Did a good interview, good on-campus visit, etc. 
and traditionally what they do with schools that have a budget for interviewing is the candidates go out for dinner and you know one last time socialize. And a person had the job locked in, but during the dinner, they reached over and grabbed the whole stick of butter and just started eating it like a popsicle. And the people were like, whoa. <laughs> and the person wasn't wasn't hired. Not because they weren't good at their job, but because they did not know how to properly handle the butter. <laughs> and so even though etiquette is probably the least of these, it can have you know important practical consequences. As far as it connects to like religion, ethics, and laws, well, we may think it could be wrong to be rude or morally commendable to be polite. And of course, religion has its own set of etiquettes, like what things you can say, what things you can touch, where you're supposed to wear, etc. And in regards to law, well, not a lot of overlap there. Most things that are just simply impolite, but not you know harmful or obscene, usually don't cross over into illegal. Now, a founder there is aesthetics. And this deals with art and beauty. Now, much like ethics, it uses the similar terms. There is good art, and there is bad art. In terms of the foundation, well, it raises a similar problem as ethics. Namely, depending on who you ask, you get different answers. Someone like Plato, were he alive, would say that beauty is objective. It is a real feature of things. Something is truly beautiful or not. Other people take the view that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, that it's subjective. And so for the foundation, you get a whole bunch of different answers, depending on which theory you're going with. In terms of rewards and punishments, well, if someone is really good at, say, singing or acting, or even not very good, but somehow manages to land roles, not talking about any particular actress who was in Twilight, not mentioning that at all, but if you are able to get certain roles, you can be, you know, get lots of money. So lots of rewards there. Now there is some overlap between aesthetics and the other areas. For example, there are works of art that raise moral questions. It could be in terms of the content. We have past works, like famously like Birth of the Nation or Triumph of the Will, that are explicitly racist films but they're considered masterpieces of cinematography. So there's a moral question of, if you have art with evil content, is that relevant to assessing it aesthetically? There's also the morality of the creator of the work. You might have a work that itself is morally innocuous, but the person creating it might be morally problematic. For example, think of, um, well, with like uh, Kevin Spacey and the Einstein guy. Kevin Stacey was on a lot of good films, but now because of revelations about him, it raises the question of, should we still watch those films because of the morality of the person involved? Or if you have someone who's you know, creating the paintings or photographs, and it turns out they're a terrible person, is that relevant to their aesthetic value? Should you say, it's a terrible film because the person who wrote the screenplay was a bad, bad person? And so a lot of issues come up there. Now, as a closing point here, all these areas, of course, distinct. But people often want to move from one to another, like from religion to law, or ethics to law, or from religion to aesthetics. But of course, we have to be careful about that. We have to justify the move from one to another. And if you want to see more about this, there is, of course, the class on ethics, offered in the spring, many classes in religion, and of course, aesthetics, which may be offered this spring. Before pressing on, anything about the stuff that needs more stuff. Now, moral thinkers have been cranking out moral theories since people have been cranking out theories. So there's a whole bunch of them. And it was kind of a quick, you know, a couple sentence run through. So that way, I guess, years from now, if you're playing Jeopardy or something, you might have some type of answer. Now, one of the oldest moral theories is what's called virtue theory, or aritaic theory. And it is based on the sensible notion that being good is a matter of developing your virtues, which are traditionally things like courage, generosity, etc. Famous dead folks who like virtue theory include our good dead friend Aristotle and also Confucius and many others. Cognitivism is a view that morality, you know, one of the questions morality is, is morality something that you 
think or something that you feel. And cognitivism is a view that is about thinking. So morality is more of an intellectual thing. Now the opposing thing, to jump ahead, would be the idea that morality is based on how you feel about the things. Uh, emotivism, the idea that it's feelings that decide good or bad. And of course this has important implications in terms of like what makes things good or bad, and also about how we make moral decisions. Do we feel our way through them, or should we think our way through them? We did see our, um, earlier on a version of cultural relativism, the idea that morality is set by the culture. So when in Rome, what the Romans do is right. An eternal classic is, of course, divine command theory. That's a view that whatever God commands is good, because he commands it, and whatever he forbids is evil, because he forbids it. Uh, the Ten Commandments, a good a practical example of, of divine command theory. Deontology, in the form we'll look at, is a view, and we'll see more when we talk about our good dead friend Emmanuel Kant, is a view that morality is a matter of rules. Following the correct moral rules is right, breaking them is bad. Ethical egoism, also a classic. This is the view that what everyone should do is act in their own self-interest. So what is right is what you regard as right for you. Now it's diff different from subjectivism. Subjectivism is whatever you think is right is right. Ethical egoism is what you should do is act in your own self-interest. And you could be wrong about that. A person could be you know, mistaken about what's actually best for them. Now famous ethical egoists include our good dead friend Tommy Hobbes, and still dead, but not dead as long, uh, Anne Rand, the famous um, you know, American-ish, philosopher-ish. If you have any familiarity with the Tea Party movement uh, or the former speaker of the House, um, both ethical egoists, the idea that what you should do is what's in your best interest. Also known non-morally as selfishness. We also saw ethical relativism, the idea that morality again is relative. Emotivism again, all about the feels. Error theory is kind of abstract. It's the idea that our moral terms are just mistaken. We're just, you know, these, we're just in error when we use them. Hedonism, not a moral view, but hedonism is the view that what one should seek is pleasure. Intuitionism is the idea that what decides whether things are good or bad are your moral intuitions, how you think slash feel about it before you've really reflected on it. There's also the sort of metaphysical debate about ethics. Moral anti-realism is the view that morality is not a real part of reality. It lacks metaphysical status. Moral realism is a view that if you're making a list of the ingredients of the world, good and evil would be in there. Plato, for example, would be a moral realist, because good for him is a real thing. Moral skepticism, we saw before, that's a view when someone says about ethics, they don't know. Natural law theory is a view that law should be based on, or is to be based on, an underlying moral system. Naturalism is a view that morality is part of the natural order of things. Prescriptivism is a view that morality is more than just saying, I feel this way. It involves saying, I feel this way, you should feel this way too. Kind of like making recommendations. It's just like one says, I really like waffles, you should like waffles too. Also saying, uh, I don't really like murdering people, you shouldn't like murdering people too. Subjectivism. Again, the view that morality is just on the individual. And lastly, teleology. This is purpose-based ethics. Our example look at this is utilitarianism. The idea that it's not following the rules that you should do, it's the consequences that matter. On the nice version, the greatest good for the greatest number. On the more harsh version, the ends justify the means. And again, those are just quick uh, two-sentence looks at 
variety of looks at morality. And there's lots more as well. The people have been moralizing for a long time. Now we'll look at the two of the big dogs of ethics, namely utilitarianism and deontology. And there, I mean, there are many other moral theories, but these are kind of the big standards. And they've infused not only philosophy, obviously, but also popular culture. Many movies, here's one recent example, of the latest Avengers movie, uh, was in part about utilitarianism versus deontology. In addition to all the punching and explosions and stuff. And it's kind of a core dispute in our ethical systems. Utilitarianism. So what is it? Well, if you believe that morality is a matter of assessing the consequences, the utility, the value to morally relevant beings, then you would be a utilitarian. Now, utilitarians have to answer a couple questions. One is, of course, when they say you should maximize utility, the question is, what do you mean by utility? And in this case, utility is a, another term for value. So utilitarian is to say, what is of value? What is of worth? And different utilitarians give different answers. The most common one is typically happiness. So happiness is good, unhappiness, bad. But in theory, you can stick anything in there. Some people put in like desire, satisfaction. Some just put in you know, pleasure. But you can put in anything. But again, the most common is happiness for positive, unhappiness for negative. The second thing utilitarians have to answer is the question of who are the relevant beings. When you're doing your utilitarian calculation, weighing the pluses and minuses, who, who counts? So utilitarianism gets divided up by what is a value, but also by who counts. And different utilitarians can give very different answers. For example, a person can be a totally racist utilitarian and say, yeah, you know, happiness matters, but only for you know, people of a certain color. Or they could be a speciesist utilitarian. Happiness matters, but only for humans, not for other, other animals. Or someone could be pretty broad. They could, they could be everybody's happiness, everything's happiness matters. <laughs> so everything they can feel, pain and pleasure matters. And so you can have very differing degrees of you know, who counts. Now another division for utilitarians, it, it's a classic you know, kind of battle, is between what's called act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. And this arose because of various problems that we'll see at, after we talk about utilitarianism in more detail. But the basic distinction, distinction is this. If you're an act utilitarian, what you do is this. If you're wondering, should I do this, you take the action just by itself and say, if I do this action, will it create more plus or minus for those who count? If the answer is more plus, it's the right thing to do. If it's more minus, wrong thing to do. And that seems like not a bad idea, but as we'll see, this can lead to dystopian nightmares that are super nightmarish. The second approach, rule utilitarianism, is what you'd do is you'd say, well, Let's take this situation. If I made this action that I'm taking into a rule that would apply generally, that we'd always follow, would that rule create more plus or minus? If the answer is more plus and minus, then you would do that generally. If it's more minus and plus, you wouldn't do that. And again, rule of utilitarianism arose because act utilitarianism seemed to lead to some nightmare scenarios. And we'll see those nightmare scenarios in the future. Now, a lot of people like utilitarianism. Famous proponents include Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, and also um, probably Dr. Strange and Iron Man as well, two noted philosophers. So why do people like utilitarianism? Well, one reason is this. When we go through life in a modern capitalist society, we often decide how to do things based on a cost benefit analysis. Like when we're buying a new phone, we look at how much does it cost and how much good does it do. When you're picking a major, similar deal. You look at you know, what are all the minuses, what are the pluses. And we do this all through life. We do a plus-minus 
analysis. So utilitarianism says, hey, why not do that with ethics as well? Weight and plus, weight and minus, more plus and minus, good. More minus and plus, bad. Second appeal, democracy. In theory, democracy is majority rule, and the idea is that supposedly that means the greatest good for the greatest number. So it seems democratic, because if you're utilitarian, you're trying to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, as opposed to just the greatest good for, like, me. Thirdly, moral intuitions. Now, one way to test a moral theory is to see how we kind of think, feel about what a theory says, and if that seems appealing to us or not. And the way this is often done is to tell like a story and show what the theory would say, and then try to appeal to how people, you know, kind of think, feel about it. If they say, yeah, that seems plausible, plus. If people say, oh, you know, that's totally problematic, either, that, either that's a problem, or you have to give people a reason why it's not a problem. For example, in many cases, especially those involving strangers and abstract situations, we almost always are utilitarians. One famous illustration of this, which has been beaten to death and then brought back and beaten to death some more, is of course the famous trolley problem. And thanks to driverless cars, it has been all over the internet. But I guess in a way that's kind of good. But here's, here's the basic problem. So, you got a trolley, and you're on the trolley, and the trolley is rolling, and for some reason, there are five people you know, tied to the tracks here, you know, old movie villain style, and one person's here, and you can't stop the trolley. So the only thing you can do is throw a lever and you squish one. Or you let it go and it runs over five people. You have no idea who these people are. They're just like random people on the track for whatever reason. Because you know, philosophy is <laughs> terrible. So what do you do? Yeah, you smush the one person. Because one is less than five. Better. Now, to use a non-contrived example, this is essentially, with a made-up example, the principle of triage in medicine. You know, suppose, you're, suppose you're a doctor, and you're doing, say, your internship. You like that, you're on some you know, exciting tropical island, and all the rest of the doctors are away you know, in a conference on the mainland. They say, don't worry, nothing's going to happen. Of course, since it's an example, or a, or a movie, something always happens. Mm -hmm. And so you're there, and there's one doctor left, Planes coming to the island crashes. And there are six people on board. Uh, one is really badly hurt. And you know from your medical experience, you could save them, but it would take so long, you'd probably lose the other five. The other five people, you know, you're, you can save them, but the, the one person that's hurt the most, the pilot, is going to die. You don't know who any of these people are. They literally fell from the sky. So you don't know if they're good or bad or what. So as a doctor, what do you do? Do you save five or do you save one? Yeah, you say five. The same principle they use, you know, they use as they develop principles of medicine. They like got the battlefield or emergency room situation. You save the most people. In that regard, we're utilitarians. We try to save the most people. So that's that's appealing. The greatest good for the greatest number. So utilitarians got a lot going in its favor. Now, the person to look at one of the most famous utilitarians of all, was a fellow named John Stuart Mill. He um, has a weird background, almost a kind of sci-fi background. His father was friends with this guy, Jeremy Bentham. Bentham kind of invented the philosophy of utilitarianism. And, I mean, he wasn't the first one to come up with the idea of, you know, greatest good for the greatest number, but he laid this out as a philosophy. And they hit on this weird idea that they needed to have people to spread the gospel of utilitarianism. So they decided to, you know, uh, John Stuart Mill's father, a friend of Bentham, decided to raise John Stuart Mill to be a genius in the cause of utilitarianism. So that way he could go out and develop it and spread it throughout the world. Which sounds like something pretty crazy, but there you go. So they raised him to be a genius, you know, having him reading all this stuff at a really young age, and he became really smart. And then he had a complete nervous breakdown, 
went to an institution for a while. Unfortunately, it was a happy ending. He got better, recovered, met the girl of his dreams, got married, and then wrote a lot of books. So, happy ending moment. Bentham, of course, was super strange as well. He had on this, this weird idea of, well, when people die, it's a shame to waste all of those bodies. Now, he didn't advocate eating them. What he advocated was, was something called auto icons. The idea would be is that people's bodies would be basically taxidermy, would be preserved after their death and put on display. And so if someone, like I said, deaths after they died, they could like sell them their taxidermy body, or someone could get like their friends to always have them have them around. Now Bentham lived this. He had himself taxidermied with all the technology at that time could provide, and gave a bunch of money to a university on the condition they displayed his body. And just like today, universities will do anything for money, so they said, sure, <laughs> we'll do that. And eventually someone sawed off his head and stole it, and the head was eventually restored. So all kinds of weird stuff going on there. Yeah, so super weird backstory there. Now, Mill, though, uh, did not have himself preserved after death, as far as I know, and wrote a lot of stuff and then died. And as far as I know, was not preserved. So what's going on in utilitarianism? Well, this is a brief excerpt from the much larger book, which lays out some of the important uh, parts of it. Now, like every great moral theory, it is, the basic principle is really simple. And here's how he defines it. Utilitarianism is the view that actions are good insofar as they promote happiness, and bad to the degree they promote the opposite of happiness, which would be unhappiness. So sort of roughly put, actions are good to the degree they create happiness, and bad to the degree they create unhappiness. Now he defines, unha oh, defines happiness as pleasure and the absence of pain. And unhappiness is the reverse, pain and the absence of pleasure. Now, Mill, of course, is not the first person to put forth pleasure as good. It goes way, way back. And not surprisingly, there's an objection against that notion. It goes back to at least Aristotle. Aristotle, when he was Aristotelizing, he considered the question, you know, what is the highest good? And he said it was happiness. And then he had to figure out, so what is that? And he does consider that maybe happiness is pleasure, because people like pleasure. But he said, happiness can't be pleasure because pleasure is a, you know, a pretty trivial thing, and it's something really suitable as well for animals. It's not like this elevated thing. Then uh, later thinkers raised a similar objection, but the gist is this. The highest good is supposed to be, well, the highest good, something noble and laudable. If we make pleasure the highest good, that's a problem because, well, the pig, symbolized here by the pig, can experience pleasure. And so the force of the objection is, if pleasure is the highest good, that casts like this life, this low animal life of just pure pleasure to be the greatest love. Now as you might imagine, some people really kind of souped up the objection, and you can make the objection even crazier to like, maximum crazy. So suppose we say that pleasure is the highest good. So all that matters is getting more of that. Well, <laughs> this is what you could do. You could take people, stick them in life support tubes, you know, with an IV, lobotomize them because that part of the brain is always causing trouble because you're thinking and worrying about stuff, and just run an electrode into their brain in, wh in, in which they get constant pleasure. You know, the pleasure sends the brain, and you know, cycle it on and off so they don't like burn out. And that would be the greatest life, being in a tube, lobotomized, with a wire in one's brain. But we would think that's the stuff of horror movies. You know, it'd be like the end reveal in a horror movie. You're like, oh my god, <laughs> that's what's going on. And that would be, you know, the horror. So that clearly is not the greatest life. So what Mill has to do is beat that objection. Because if pleasure is the highest good, it seems to say this life of a swine, or even worse, this life is the greatest life. So Mill like anybody who takes pleasure to be the highest good, has to beat that. Now Mill has the following replies. First reply is kind of turning the tables. B 
because he says the person who raises objection says the only pleasures that people can experience are those of the pig. So they're casting people as pigs. So it's not he that is saying people are pigs, it is they, which is kind of a clever turnaround. His second and more substantial reply is this. The, again, the force of the objection is the low quality pleasures, you know, pig pleasures, create the most pleasure, so they're the best. But clearly that's absurd. So what he tries to do is argue that when we assess pleasures, we don't just go by quantity, we also go by quality. Sure, by sheer quantity, the pig pleasures win. But he argues we don't go by sheer quantity in other areas. So is he right by that? When we assess stuff in life, do we only care about sheer quantity? Like if you go to a restaurant, you say, just, I don't care how good the food is, just bring me buckets of it. <laughs> no, typically. <laughs> yeah, so we assess food not just based on is there like big buckets of it, but how, how much quality. I mean, quantity does matter, but we consider quality as well. So Mill notes correctly that we do consider quality, not just quantity. So he sets up the following sort of empirical test, because Mill is empiricist before he died. And here's how you test the difference in quality. And it's an empirical test. You could run this with a, you know, a psychological study. He said you take any two pleasures, A and B. And if you're wondering, does A have higher quality than B, here's what you do. You offer people unlimited B with little or no effort. In order to get A, it takes more, more effort and there's less of it. If they would still pick A over B, A is higher quality. Now, Mill doesn't give like an analogy of this, but you could see this as a test for determining you know, the value of anything. So suppose you're like an alien anthropologist and you came to Earth and you wondered, what are humans really like? And this is how you could test it. You go to humans and say, you can have um, as much mud as you want, uh, unlimited mud, or you can have a little bit of gold, but you gotta do some jumping jacks for it. Well, how would that go? Yeah, people would do jumping jacks and get the gold and say no thanks to the, the mud. Yeah, so it's a pretty good test. So Mill says you just put whatever pleasures you want in those slots and test them up. Now Mill is of course aware that there would be people who would select, you know, you know, awful stuff. You know, uh, yeah, give me, give me buckets and buckets of, I don't care about the quality, just bring me buckets of pizza. I don't care if it's good pizza or not. Or hey, don't even bother pizza, just bring me lard, buckets of lard. <laughs> yeah, there are people that would be like that. So Mill, to solve that, he says the people you'd use for this empirical test have to be capable of appreciating both. And similarly, for the higher quality pleasures, there would be people who just, like, if you're going to throw a ballet in there, the people would be like, ugh. I'll take anything except for, for ballet. It seemed a fair, basically a fair evaluation. People who, who could appreciate both of them. Now Mill claims that if you plug in all the animal pleasures, just the raw animal pleasures, and then these would be the, what we consider the nobler pleasures. And Mill, of course, being an intellectual elitist, has things like you know learning philosophy, reading poetry, listening to music, etc. in there. But think of, you know, this would be like things that we consider to be elevated human pleasures, and this would be you know, just raw physical pleasures. Now, Mill claims that if you're given a choice between the two, he says people will, and he considers a couple exceptions, will pick the better. Um, for example, or to illustrate. And we can make a um, mad science or crazy wizardry example. Suppose there's a mad scientist or wizard who's developed a way of transforming or polymorphing people from human to animal. And the person will create an ironclad guaranteed legal contract that if you agree to be transformed into a golden retriever, you'll lose all your, you know, you'll be a golden retriever. You won't have any of your human capabilities anymore, but it's guaranteed you'll have the best life for a golden retriever. Ironclad guaranteed, 
no, no taking back, no, no pressure. So it's not going to be like a horrible reveal at the end where you're made into a golden retriever, you know, steak or something. So what would people pick? Stay human with all the troubles or be a super happy golden retriever? Well, well most people would take what? Human. Yeah, staying human. Because being a human, even with like having to pay taxes and stuff, is better than being a happy dog. Once you, once you, but there are cases where maybe life is super terrible, then maybe it would be better. Samil says that people will pick the to remain, you know, take the the human life, the higher quality pleasures, over the unlimited lesser pleasures, and he says that shows that these are higher quality. And as he sees it, that beats the pig objection because yeah. Pleasures are the highest good, but the best pleasures are the higher pleasures, not the pig pleasures. So the pig objection is slice into bacon. Delicious, delicious bacon. <clears throat> now, he does consider a couple of potential you know, objections. What about the fact, well, the main objection is this. As a matter of fact, people do pick the lower over the in his day, in our day, we can point to people who are, you know, addicted to drugs, for example, and it ruins, like think of the opioid epidemic today, or past epidemics of drugs that occur. And this, you know, the story is always, you know, pretty much the same. If a person gets, you know, fully hooked into the drugs, their life spirals down, they lose their friends, their family, their house, their job, everything, and then they're on the streets, and then often they, they die horribly. And so you have this terrible spiral. But people do make that choice. So how does Mill explain that? Well, he gives two, two responses. One is, is that this often occurs when people don't have other options. Everything else is so terrible, that's their, their option. So they're not freely choosing it, they're pushed, pushed into it. I mean, a good example would be like, when you hear most people's stories of getting into opioid addiction, it's not, you know, one day I was just hanging out at Starbucks and thought, hey, you know what would go good with my latte? Some opium. <laughs> it's usually they, you know, someone gets, they get like in a car accident or an injured at work. The doctor says, hey, here's a crap load of prescriptions for opioids. Enjoy. And I remember when I had my surgery back in um, 2008, they did. Every time I went into the doctor, like, He's kept writing me a prescription for opioids. And I was like, there's got to be something wrong with this because that's a lot of opioids. A lot of opioids. So I, don't, I still have the prescription sitting. Not the, I sell the paper there. I'm like, I, don't, <laughs> I know what this stuff is. I don't want, I don't want that. Definitely not. And so, um, yeah, people get into that. And the story is not, you know, I just freely chose it. It's often they get badly hurt. The doctor writes a ton of prescriptions for opioids. They get hooked on them. And then, the second reply brings us this. He notes that people are aware that one pleasure is better than another, but correctly he notes that people discount the future. It's a standard concern problem in well, you know, philosophy, critical thinking, but also in economics. That what people will do is they will value a closer good that's worth less than a future good just because it's closer. It's a, um, kind of a, a classic example of this is the, the marshmallow test. They offered uh, kids, like, you can have one marshmallow now, or if you wait, you can have two marshmallows later. And they found that, supposedly, the kids who can hold up the two marshmallows they end up being more successful, because they can defer gratification, or suppose. So if you want to train them, if you have kids, you want to train them, teach them to wait for the two marshmallows. <laughs> so, Mill says what people will do is they'll pick a newer thing that's worse than a future good, even though they fully understand. The other illustration is this. Back when I was in grad school, uh, some grad students smoked, most of them did. And there's always, of course, someone who, you know, people don't smoke. And I was in a, a seminar where the professor didn't smoke, but he was a marathoner as well, so he loved to torture smokers, as I approved of fully. And so he, he wouldn't have any, like, he, he watched the smokers and you could see him kind of laughing because they were like, struggling because they're hacking at their nicotine. 
And then, you know, we, then people would go out and they'd go around and they'd smoke, smoke, smoke. And someone would go to the smokers and say, you know that's bad for you, right? And of course, every smoker, I don't know if they're expecting, like a person saying, I had no idea. Thank you for saving me. But no, all smokers know smoking is terrible. And one of the, you know, they were asked, like, why do you smoke? And the person said, yeah, I know the cancer emphysema. It's going to cause that, but that's way off in the future. And the smoky goodness of these smoky treats is right here, right now. And they, I mean, they were making Mill's point that they were fully aware that they were making a bad choice, but their reasoning was the enjoyment now is here, and the death by cancer is in the future. And so in a way, that nicely proves Mill's point. They completely understood they were making a bad choice and the wrong choice, and providing Mill with a you know, good example to use in, <laughs> about Mill. So Mill says, yeah, people will pick the, the wrong choice over the better choice, even though they know better, because they're doing it wrong. And he thinks that solves the problem. So to his satisfaction, Mill thinks he's shown, OK, Pig objection, defeated. Now, his theory again is, you know, actions are good to the degree they promote happiness, bad to the degree they promote unhappiness. And so the value question is answered. So what is the value? Mill's answer is happiness, positive value, negative value is unhappiness. Now the second question utilitarians have to answer is, who counts when you're doing your plus minus calculation? Who gets on the scales? And that's a really important question. For example, think about um, the ethics of eating animals. If you're utilitarian and you only count humans, then eating animals is fine because they don't matter. But if you consider all creatures that can feel pain to count, then you might want to be a vegetarian or a vegan because those animals, their suffering would, would matter. And you have to weigh the suffering of animals against the pluses we get from eating them. Now, Mill is super generous. He says, the standard is not my happiness or your happiness, but the happiness of everyone. And he says, as far as the nature of things permits, all of sentient creation. So for him, all people count, as he said, but he goes beyond that. So anything they can feel, pleasure or pain, would matter. And the reason why is, for Mill, pleasure is good. It's a plus. So whatever can feel pleasure puts pluses in the, you know, the good box. And pain, anything they can feel pain, puts negatives into the negative points into the, the pain box. And so for him, pretty much anything they can feel would, would count. Now, a later thinker, a guy who's still alive today and gets in the news because he's really good at self-promotion through outrageous claims, is this guy, uh, Peter Singer. He wrote a book called Animal Liberation. And I remember that because I read that one as a freshman and it ruined my birthday forever. Here's why. <laughs> if you like veal, you want to like stick your fingers in your ears and go la 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 because I'm about to ruin veal for you. Unless it's already ruined. So I found out reading that stupid book that the way they make veal is they basically torture veal caps. They put them in these terrible stalls and they're like in their own feces and horrible, horrible, horrible. And so Peter Sainer convinced me that you know the treatment of the calves is so wrong that the enjoyment they get out of eating veal is vastly outweighed by their suffering. And yeah, of course I know that my not eating veal has you know no impact on the industry, but I don't know do not want to be part of that particular particular crime. And thanks to Peter Singer, my birthday meal has been ruined forever. I'll never eat veal again. But although they're working on synthetic meat, so maybe someday I'll make a synthetic veal. So I get to work on that, scientists. I need my veal. <laughs> yeah, so that would be a utilitarian argument. Namely that we shouldn't eat meat because the harm and suffering of the animals. Now, of course, you could counter it by saying that you know, we get more, more plus out of it, that we enjoy eating them more than they enjoy it. So for him, pretty broad scope. Now, of course, he's going to prove this. Because it's easy to get people, if you go to someone and say, hey, do you care about your own happiness? Pretty much everyone says, yeah, I do. 
So the challenge is getting everybody to care about everybody's happiness, to say every, everything that feels pleasure and pain counts. So Mill has to get people to buy that. So here's how he tries to do it. He notes that if you're going to ask questions about uh, ultimate ends, like what is good, this is kind of challenging to sell. But he thinks he can do it with an argument by analogy, almost, to save the day. Now here's how he does it. The way you prove that something is visible is that people can see it. So if I say, is this visible? And everyone would say, oh yes, I can see it. Now the way you prove something is audible is that people can hear it. So he says by analogy, the way you prove something is desirable and questions about what is the ultimate end, what is the goal of morality, are questions about what is desirable. And so the proof is, by analogy, you prove what is desirable by asking people, hey, do you desire this? And if you say to people, do you want some happiness? People say, oh yes, yes I do. So that part seems okay, but unfortunately it's got a big problem. And here's the problem. There's a fallacy called the fallacy of equivocation, which occurs thanks to the power of ambiguity. Ambiguity is when something has two or more meanings and it's not clear from the context what is intended, common you know, problem in communication. Now, equivocation is when someone uses an ambiguous word and switches from one meaning to another, but acts as if they didn't do that. So they're using the one meaning and using another meaning and acting like they're using just one meaning, not two. So here's the accusation against Mill. Desirable, of course, has two meanings. One is sort of literally able to be desired, which means that people can do that. And that's an easy test. You just shape people like, do you desire this? And people go, yeah, well, <laughs> desirable. But there's also the other meaning which we think of the meaning for ethics, is not just people that can desire it, but a normative one, namely that people should desire it. For example, when people say that pornography is undesirable, are they saying that no one wants pornography? No, because that would clearly be untrue. What they're saying is, not that people don't want it, but people shouldn't want it. So, Desirable can be taken as people do desire it, or people should desire it. And Mill shifts between those, because the desirable of ethics is people should desire it, whereas what he goes to is people do. Like with Audible, there's no moral component. It's not that people should hear it, people do hear it. And so critics have said he's equivocating. He's going from people want happiness they desire it, to therefore it is good. And defenders say, no, he's not. <laughs> so the battle goes on. So then, how does this prove, according to Mill, that everybody's happiness is of concern? Well, here's how he does it. So he's approved to, to satisfaction that each person wants her own happiness because they desire it. So it's desirable. And then he does this. He says, well, look, here's each of us. We, we all agree that each of us desire our own happiness. It's desirable to each of us. Therefore, he says, therefore, the sum of all happiness is a good for all of us. So my happiness is good for me. Your happiness is good for you. So our happiness is good for all of us. So that's why all of the total happiness matters. Now, critics have claimed that Mill is committing another fallacy here namely a fallacy of composition. And that's a fallacy where you go from what is true of the parts to it being true of the whole. So it's true that my happiness is good for me, but it may seem too quick to say our happiness is good for all of us, to illustrate. Now each of us has money, varying degrees of money. Now, so in one sense, if you're just like doing like a mathematical sum, you could talk about the sum of all our money. That would just be you know, how much money you got, how much money you got, 
and we have a total of one trillion dollars. <laughs> Probably less than that. I'll go with a bit. That's more realistic. Now, on one hand, our money is our money, but is our money really our money? Are you worried about like how much money I've got? No. <laughs> So, yeah, true, you know, my money is my money, your money is your money, our money is our money, but it's not really our money. And you're not super worried about, like, my money or other people's money. You're worried about your own money. So critics have said that this doesn't work because it's a fallacy of composition. That, yeah, true, I care about my money, and you care about your money, and in a sense we all have our money, but it's not really our money, like a shared bank account. Now, Mill's defenders, of course, have said, no, he doesn't. He's I mean, they do more than that, but that's all we got time for. Okay, so next time, more mill, something good the rest of the day. Next time, more stuff. <laughs>